guy, Evan Novi Williams, with us. You might have heard him this morning with Sheehan, but he was our guy first. I, I, at least I think. Evan, you were you on with me first on, on I was on with you first. Yeah, take that, Sheehan. I, I love that. all the 980 shows, though, equally. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's fair. That's fair. We have, we have a good lineup over here. Um, but, no, we're excited to have Evan. He was the one who broke the news yesterday about Magic Johnson. And, and I'll start with this very broad question, Evan. What is the significance of Magic Johnson joining the Rails Harris bid? I, th- I think there's two things here, and, and neither of them is the financial. I saw a lot of people asking on Twitter, yeah, how, how important is, Ma- is Magic's money? The answer is not that important. Uh, but uh, I think there's two things. One, Magic is obviously extremely experienced in the world of sports ownership. He was, uh, he is an owner of the Dodgers. He's an owner of the WNBA's Sparks. He's an owner of the L- uh, LAFC in, in Major League Soccer. He understands the way that these things work. Um, and not that Josh Harris doesn't, but mm-hmm. it's always good to have ad- additional expertise, a, diff- a, a, a different lens through which to view things. And, and Magic can provide that. And, and, and the other thing is that he, uh, and, and the Dodgers are a perfect example of this. He can be the face of an ownership group. And Josh Harris with the 76ers and the Devils is not particularly good at that. I don't know Mitchell Rails. I don't know if he wants to be that. But but it seems like neither of these guys are going to be the very gregarious public face of the commanders if they do end up buying this team. And there's value to having that. And and I do think, um, this is not news to you, Craig, the, 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 the trust between commanders fans and the and the and the ownership of this group of this team is obviously very broken and whoever comes in after this i think understands that there is outreach and some healing that needs to happen between fan base and organization and magic johnson is an extremely uh, likable very charismatic uh person and and he seems like and i don't know if this is definitely the role he's going to take but he seems like the perfect person that can start to bridge that gap and be very public representing the ownership group to the people of D.C. And, and, and the Commanders fan base. So he does on some level, although I will say he has done all of the things he's done so far in L.A. Yeah. That to me, like, people I don't think outside of L.A. understand, like, how much of a king in Los Angeles Magic Johnson is. Maybe if, if you've been watching a lot of the, like, the Hulu series or, or some of the documentaries or the HBO series, uh, which is obviously a fictionalized version of all of that, but, like, kind of gets to the point of, like, Magic is the man. He is that guy. The Apple TV documentary was, was fantastic on Magic. Mm-hmm. And that's not to say his knowledge on how the inner workings of a sports organization and what he's done with the Dodgers and how involved he's been in some of these, even though he financially is a minority partner, isn't big. But in terms of the public face, I do wonder how that plays in D.C. versus L.A., where a lot of people now look, Dan Snyder was from Bethesda and and like grew up here and was a fan in the whole thing. And that went. Uh, But, you know, there is some excitement, I think, about Harris and Rails being like D.C. guys and, and people that care about the team. And I just wonder how and I don't know if you have thoughts on this, but like how the Magic Johnson public face card plays in L.A., which, by the way, is a majority black city, like Chocolate City, the whole deal. And, and Magic is one of the most famous black men in America, if not the world. Yeah, so th- there's two things there. One, you're right. There's nothing specifically D.C. about Magic. And you, know, you don't need any more evidence than the fact that he was part of Harris's bid to buy the Broncos, right, too, right? right? And, and there is a chance that he, he would have served the exact same purpose, whatever he's going to do with the commanders, that he would have done the same if Harris had been successful in trying to buy the Broncos. So I don't think there's a regional tie here. I do think that the diversity piece is especially interesting, both in D.C., as you said, and in the NFL writ large. The Every year at the Super Bowl when Roger Goodell gives his State of the Union address, uh, he gets peppered with questions about diversity, not just in the coaching ranks, also in the ownership ranks. This is something the, the league cares about. It is something the league has not done very well as of yet. Um, and again, to keep bringing up the, the Broncos sale, when, when Rob Walton brought the Broncos last year, three of his minority partners were, were, were people of color. Melody Hobson, who's a, who's, a, who's a notable investor, Lewis Hamilton, the F1 driver, and then mm. Condoleezza Rice. Um, and, and that is something that, not that the NFL has a direct say in who Dan Snyder sells to, but there is definitely a, a priority and, and a preference at the NFL that, that whoever is buying into this league, in which a majority, I believe, of the players are black, um, they, they want to have some diversity. And particularly uh, from the African-American communities, they want to have diversity in these groups. No doubt about it. Uh, I believe the latest numbers are, and typically the number of terms of players split is about 70% black. 70, okay. Uh, in, in the league, it typically floats somewhere in that range. And to be clear, like, if Magic wants to do it, 
he's going to be great at it because Magic Johnson being Magic Johnson is like what he's he's best at. Even yeah. though he's re- that's not to say he's a really good businessman. Like he is one of the best business people in America for how he's built a variety of his empires uh, since since retiring from the NBA and has grown himself into a billionaire. But he is so good at being the public face. I just think it's interesting that he has obviously done most of that in Los Angeles. And, like, you know, part of that is a being on the ground, like a time commitment and, like, being in the communities. And if he lives in Los Angeles, like, that's that's a that's a decent uh, far away or distance away from here. So, like, just that's, that's a functional question as much as anything compared to, like, a... Uh, uh, will he or will he be good at it question because I certainly am not going to be the one to doubt Magic Johnson if he sets his mind to something. And to be totally clear, I, I, I have not talked to anyone at, within the, the Harris group that said directly that he is going to be the, the face mm-hmm. of this group. There's a chance that he and Josh are you know friends and they like to bounce ideas off each other and this was an opportunity that he wanted to participate in as well. So I do think there's a broad spectrum of things that Magic can be involved in but from a financial standpoint yeah this is a this is a very small piece of of whatever this bid group ends up being exactly no doubt uh eben novi williams is with us from sportico he broke the magic news all right let's let's get into wild speculation land yeah it doesn't seem like anybody really knows where we're at because as you and i have talked about and we've talked about on the show dan snyder's circle of people that he talks to is very 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 small which has made this incredibly difficult to report on but it it does seem like in the last you know even today like folks like albert breer are saying there's there's not like at this point it's going to take a a big acceleration in the process to be done by the owners meetings next week is that kind of what you're hearing as well where are we in terms of a timeline right now to the best of your knowledge i think that's right i did hear that there was some acceleration in conversations over the past week um I, i don't get the sense that Dan, Dan has not gotten the number that he wants yet, right? I think this would be a done deal if either Harris or Jeff Bezos or someone had been willing to get to the price he wants. Do you have and, any and idea what that price is? My guess would be six billion. That's that's a semi-informed speculation. And and you and I have talked about this before, Craig. Josh Harris is not the guy that overpays for things. Right? Mm-hmm. It's the reason he was the runner-up for the Mets. It was the reason he was the runner-up for the Broncos. He's been involved in a lot of these processes. He's lost a lot of these processes because he's he's the guy who says this asset is worth this, and as a result, I'm willing to pay that. Um, and and most sports teams are sold uh, to people who are opposite. Right? Matt Ishbia just paid four billion dollars for the Suns. Matt Ishbia didn't need to pay four billion dollars for the Suns. Um, that was just a. He was like, I want to do this process quickly. Let's put a, let's put this valuation on it. I'll buy fifty percent now. I'll buy more later, and and that's it. So, uh, yeah, I think if if Dan has this number in his head, and it does not seem like there's a whole bunch of other bidders out there. I, I don't know that for sure. There there often are ones that stay totally under the radar. Uh, so maybe there's a couple others, but I, there's a chance, Craig, that this is just. Josh and Dan staring each other in the face, waiting to see who blinks first, right? And and Dan saying, you know, you, you got to get higher. And Josh saying, I don't. I, I, I'm not sure you have anyone else. And this is what I think the thing is worth. Um, and that's a standoff that could take could take months, right? Who, who knows? Um, Jeff Bezos, as you and I have discussed, also obviously looms pretty large in the background. I think every day that goes by that his, he's not directly involved makes it less likely that he will be. But I think you also always have this this fear in the back if you're Josh Harris that, you know, suddenly this you, you get a call one day and just say, OK, Jeff came in five hundred million dollars ahead of you and, and, and this is over. But my guess is that the longer this goes on without Josh getting that call, the, the more firmly he's willing to stay entrenched at, at whatever number he's at. Uh, and in that case, then you go back to the original question that probably everybody had way back when, when Bank of America was hired by the Snyders, are they willing to sell? Do they want to do this? What's it going to take to do it? And and that still also remains a pretty central. It's funny how so many of the things that, that I'm sure you were discussing and, and we were discussing at Sportico and, and from back in day one seem to be the same questions that are bouncing around right now, even though theoretically we're, we're way deeper in this process than we were. Yeah. I, I don't know, man, because I will say, for the people I've talked to, which is a very small number, and I don't cover this day-to-day like you do, and, and you have sources obviously in different places because you cover sports business. I cover football to the extent that I cover anything, and I'm not just a talking head spouting opinions these days. Uh, but when you talk to people uh, here, or people around the organization, et cetera, I mean, and this stuff is obviously out there in different publications now, like there's Dan selling. Like that is that is the one thing I've said I feel very comfortable saying right now. Like this is happening 
and it feels like it's happening fairly soon, although soon could be days, weeks, or months. Um, but within, within I, I would say, closer to two months than, like, it's, it's not something we're going to be dealing with in training camp, six months or whatever from right now. That That is the general sense of the people on the ground in D.C. who are talking about it, um, is the general consensus amongst beat reporters, et cetera. Um, and, and in that way, what you're saying is is a little bit of a departure mm-hmm. in that, like, there still is this question of, like, will, will Dan just be like, ah, never mind. It's like, well, he's... He already doesn't live here anymore. He lives either in London or on his boat. He, you know, the clearing out the offices thing is not just real. It's like something that was done a long time ago. He seems to have mentally checked out completely. And to the extent that anyone is still involved from his family, it is Tanya. And occasionally, like, she'll answer the phone from, you know, I guess Jason or Ron or whoever. And it's like, yeah, do your thing. The check is going to clear. And, and they continue on with their business. So the question is, like, what if this is a stare down between Harris and and Dan with Bezos kind of lurking, going like I could drop the hammer? Um, how does how does that stalemate get broken based off of what you've seen in the past in similar situations, and also what you know about the parties involved? Yeah, and I'll play devil's advocate for a second. I, I think if you were an advisor to Dan or a sports banker, for example, in December, and Dan came to you and said. I'm thinking about selling this team. What do you think it's going to sell for? I think you would have gotten some very big numbers, like ones that begin with a seven, for example. It it just felt like after the Suns sold for four billion, there was so much momentum that the general market assumption was this is going to get a high number, right? Um, And now I think the real reality is the team is so expensive. uh, There there maybe hasn't been as much bidding action as they expected, Uh, and I can see a world where Dan believed a few months ago, like, yeah, this team's going to sell for $7 billion. I'm great. I'm going to get out of here. And and now if he's looking at 5.8 or 5.7, that, that maybe he has a different a different feeling about it. And, and we've seen this, and I, again, I don't know this directly about, about Dan's thinking. We've seen this in other sales, right? There, there have been a number of big multi-billion dollar sports assets in the past few months that went on the market. The, the Angels, for example, the, the, the Liverpool FC, Went on the market. Um, they went through a kind of very early sales process, gauged interest, decided mm, maybe, maybe maybe this asset isn't going to be for sale for too much longer. The in DC, as you know, obviously the Nationals. Um, I think if the market was what the learners wanted, th- there would be a new owner of the Nationals already right now. I think the, probably the reality is that. People tested the water and realized that maybe the number wasn't there that they were expecting. We'll see what happens with, with Manchester United. That'd be another interesting litmus test here. Um, but but it, it doesn't seem crazy to me to think that the, the, the number that Dan Snyder thought he would get and the number that maybe his advisors were telling him, this team is going to sell for, for at least this, uh, may be coming down the longer we have that conversation. I think that's the thing that scares people in the NFL that really want Dan to sell. Is that um, and maybe really want Jeff to be the one that solves this problem for him? But uh, I think their concern has always been uh, they're confident that he would sell at the right number. But if that number doesn't come around, you know what happens? Right. And does he give in? Does I don't know that that becomes a really interesting question. Evan Noby Williams, the supporter, goes with us. Do you think Rails for what? And it, I don't know how much you know about him, but like, is he the kind of guy that would just be like Josh? It's two hundred million dollars on a six billion dollar deal. I know that's a lot of money, but like, we're we're doing this. It, it, it's a it's a good question. I have no, I I've never talked to Mitchell Rails. I I don't know much about him, and I don't know what the what the working relationship or even the financial arrangement is between between him and Josh. The the, the crazy thing about the two of them, right, is that Josh is worth around seven billion dollars, and and Rails is worth like six and a half billion dollars. And it seems like even between them, they don't have enough money to buy this team, right? Like right. they're they're also out there looking for LPs and and raising money. Like the 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 amount of money and and cash that it takes to buy an NFL franchise, particularly one that is as valuable as the Commanders is, one of, one of the ten most valuable in the league, uh, is so much money, right? Like these are two of the richest men in America, and and they've teamed up, and they still need cash, right? It's it's, it's one of the central problems I think in the NFL that they're going to have to deal with soon is that they they've reached a point where that where where the crown jewel assets in the league are out of out of reach for literally the top half of 1% of richest people in in the US um and I do think that 
that becomes tricky if again if if you if you have a specific price you're trying to get to or even if you if you're trying to continually raise the value of of these leagues that the Broncos just sold to the 11th richest man in the world right like who who do you sell to after <laughs> after that's the that's, after they want that's the bar you need to clear yeah Jeff Bezos seems obvious and then if, if Jeff Bezos buys this team who buys the Seahawks right, right. when, well, when they say, sell yeah. like who who is the who's who comes after Jeff Bezos it, it is a really interesting uh, kind of paradox right now for the NFL because value accretion is so valuable it's so it's such a top importance to owners but when it comes time to sell them uh, they're they're going to have some trouble if they want to right so the liquidity is part of the problem here they have to have what 30% in cash 30% um, cash and 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 the debt limit is way lower than it is in other leagues right it's only a one and a half billion i think or a billion it's something right in there so it's not like you can highly leverage yourself to make this transaction possible, which you can do in other leagues. Right. So that's what I was going to ask is, especially considering they waived the debt limit for Snyder to buy out his minority partners, (laughs) and they want nothing more than Dan out of the league. If it is like, hey, they're at 5'8", Dan's willing to do it. The problem is they don't have the liquidity or they would need to take on extra debt, but they can secure the loans. It's just an NFL rule. Do you think the NFL would, and the, I guess it would be the owners coming together to change that? I, I think the, the longer this goes on, I think that that becomes slightly more likely. And I know the NFL and its owners are having these conversations already, right? The, the thing they do not want to do is take the unprecedented step of voting him out, right? Having that kind of internal trial within the NFL and its owners, that is a step that, that I don't, very few owners, even the ones who, who have the strongest feelings towards Snyder, I don't think anybody wants to take that step. Um, but you're right. There, there's little things you can do in the middle to make this transaction easier, maybe even raise the valuation in the deal. Um, and private equity is a perfect example. Debt limit raising, as you're mentioning, is, is another great example. The NFL so far has, has certainly not made any of those moves, but th- there is a lot, <laughs> there's a lot of desire in that league to, to have a different owner of the Washington Commanders. And I do think, again, the, the longer this draws out, I think the more willing some owners will be to put some of that on the table. And, and the truth is, Craig, a lot of owners want those things already for themselves. Right. Mm. If you're an owner in, in just pick a random NFL team and, and you're looking to sell, I'd love to take 10% off the table, but I can't get anyone to, to, to give me $400 million for 10% of my team. There are some private equity funds out there that would probably jump at that opportunity. And owners know that, right? So it's not as though owners are a monolith on this. There are a lot of owners who already want the debt limit raised, who already want the ability to bring in a, a, a fund, a uh, private equity group to buy in a chunk of their team already. So some people may also just view this as opportunistic, that I want these rules changed already. And, and maybe Snyder is the argument I can make that, that can get enough owners on my side to, 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 to make that a reality. What do you expect next week? I guess it's this weekend at the owners meetings. Yeah, it's a it's a great question. I, it, there there seems like a chance that 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 there's a presentation of some sort on a on a potential uh, a actual deal. Um, again, the, the the further we go from 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 now without a deal, that seems less likely. Um, there is certainly privately going to be a lot of conversation about uh, a, about this problem and and what happens as it draws out. Where are we? Um, you're right about how how kind of inner circle this this sale has been. A lot of times during NFL sales, NFL, other owners, people at the league are, are very involved and, and they know. I, there's also probably going to be a lot of, what, what, what are you hearing? What, what what actually is happening? I think owners are, are probably going to start to want at least some kind of a briefing on where things stand so that they can start to really make informed thoughts about these exact things themselves. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know how much publicly is going to be talked at all. Jim Ursay uh, the owner of the Colts obviously made some waves at, at one of the more recent NFL owners meetings when he became the first, the first sitting owner to, to publicly say that, that he thought there, that maybe it was time to start taking actions to get Dan out. Maybe you get more of that. The, the, I, I do think there's going to start to be both publicly and certainly privately and probably publicly, maybe a little more pressure starting to, 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 to be, to be applied by the NFL and the owners about, about Dan. And, and obviously the Mary Jo white report is, is looming in the background here also, which is a, probably a very large pressure, uh, pressure play as, as well. Um, yeah, I think there's, I don't know exactly what's going to happen publicly at those owners meetings, but I guarantee you privately, it is going to yeah. be a central theme of conversations as owners start to think about if it comes to it, what are we willing to do to make this sale more of a reality? 
Uh, are you going out to Phoenix? I'm not. No, unfortunately, we have uh, one of my colleagues, Barry Bloom, is out in is out in Phoenix. So I believe he's okay. going to be swinging over there. Um, I gotcha. wish I could, I could make it. I've done a lot of travel. Are you Are you going down? I'm not. I wish. Okay. Um, Phoenix is one of my favorite cities, and I was going to say, if you were going, I was going to give you the number one rule for Phoenix. Are you aware of the number one rule for visiting Phoenix, uh, Arizona? Craig, you should have told me this before the Super Bowl. I went for the first time uh, a month ago, and now I'm very curious about the number one rule. Number one rule for Phoenix, Arizona. If you're there for longer than three days, this is hard to do for the entirety of the trip, but if you eat something that's not wrapped in a tortilla, you did it wrong. <laughs> okay, so I Just had a couple The best I had some tacos, tacos, the best burritos, like, and you can have breakfast, lunch, dinner, like... Just at least at least two meals a day need to be I, wrapped in a tortilla. I should have asked you before I went. Um, I, w- uh, I will say that my Super Bowl eating was I would I would give myself a, a D, maybe a D minus. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Super Bowl can be a little tough on that. You're, yeah, for sure. Depending on what you got to do. All right, Evan Novi Williams. Uh, you can read him in Sportico. You can hear him frequently. Thankfully, here on the Hoffman Show, we always appreciate his time. Thank you, sir. And uh, I'm sure we'll be talking soon. Thanks, Craig. This is the Hoffman Show on the Team 980 and the Odyssey app.